Welcome to lecture six of the series. It is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Professor Somers and her talk today. And um, I will start my introduction with a well-known paradox. In terms of our profession, historians come from a long lineage of epic poets, chroniclers, and bards. But not many of my professional colleagues are engaging storytellers. Many historians focus all of their energy on research, argumentation, and historiography. And this is very important, vital even. But what in my mind distinguishes a good work of history from a great work are the stories that a historian pieces together. These are the stories that make us relate to characters removed from us in space and in time, empathize with them. Those are the stories that have a plot that unfolds through relationships that characters have with each other. And you cannot help but be drawn into a story. Now, today, you will have the pleasure of hearing a talk from a world-class scholar. I could spend the whole time of this meeting talking about her scholarly achievements and projects. Professor Summers is incredibly skillful in providing solid evidence, convincing arguments, and astonishing archival accuracy in her research. She does all of that through the power of storytelling. And this is why, to me, her work is so compelling. Susan Summers is a professor of history at St. Vincent College, and she has built a corpus of scholarly work exploring Freemasonry, fraternalism, politics, society, and ideas in the 18th and 19th century England and America. She is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in the UK and an affiliate with King's College in London, a recipient of numerous awards, including an excellence in teaching. She serves as a general editor and member of the editorial board of the Journal for Research into Freemasonry and Fraternalism. And she organizes international conferences and lecture series like this one. A prolific writer and presenter, Professor Somers has authored numerous articles for academic journals, as well as presented at a variety of academic and Masonic conferences. In addition to countless written contributions, I was, I, it was really striking to me, the, there are 34 entries from her in a monumental three volume Le Monde Masonique edited by Cécile Rivagère and Charles Forset. She is the author of four monographs her most recent book, The Siblies of London, A Family on the Esoteric Fringes of Georgia and England, is published by Oxford in 2018. Now, I hope you're getting a glimpse of how impressive the scholarship of Professor Somers is. After a first meeting in Canonbury Masonic Research Center in London in 2009, I could not help but be drawn into her audience following her work and all of the vignettes that she is interweaving into her arguments. Now I would like you to experience Professor Summer's powerful formula in combining such consistently impressive scholarship with engaging storytelling. She is going to talk today about the life of Benedict Chastanier, reconstructing his milieu. So please help me welcome Professor Summers to our virtual stage right now. Oh my goodness. I thought we agreed on a brief introduction. Thank you. That's just so flattering. And, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I, I had a, um, a typical uh, performance anxiety dream last night, like you usually have the, the night before classes begin. And I dreamt that, that there were four people who showed up for my talk and they were all my relatives. 
Um, and and but but I'm glad to see so many of you coming for for a very very uh, esoteric and and removed talk from from what many of you have experienced. So sit back. I hope I live up to the billing. Um, we'll see, won't we? As a female researcher in one of the most masculine of fields, Masonic history, I've had the rare privilege of a mentor of my own sex who took me under her wing and included me in what we must salute as one of the most significant recent scholarly projects in our field. Thank you, Cecile. Now you see why I wanted you to be here today for undertaking with Charles Pousset Le Monde Maconique and for encouraging me to adopt careful Masonic biography as a model for my own projects as well. In Le Monde Maconique, Cecile asked contributors to reintegrate the fragmented lives of 18th century figures who were known only in their public capacity and not also as Freemasons or members of other fraternal associations. The life of my subject today, Peter Benedict Chastanier, demonstrates that biography also benefits from reintegration beginning with Freemasonry and working in the other direction, toward the public and the private, uh, but non-Masonic aspects of life. Before proceeding, I also need to recognize the important new book um, by my colleagues Natalie and Robert, who, who you're meeting today as well, Initiating the Millennium, in which they examine other important aspects of Shastani's esoteric connections and activities in that context. All of our work combined is only the beginning of the proper biography of character as fascinating as Shastanier deserves. That said, reconstructing even the broad outlines of Shastanier's mundane life is complicated. He was poor. Uh, he was devoted to translating and publicizing Emanuel Swedenborg's prophecies, and that's what he spent almost all of his money and time on. Uh, and the unfortunate fact that over time, his name has become a magnet for contradictory and fabricated histories. He was, as the Swedenborgian New Church historian James Hyde noted, an easy victim for the heresy hunter. Whether that hunter wished to condemn or celebrate deviations from what was commonly accepted, Chastanier deviated. While I will cast considerable doubt on the details of his involvement with Freemasonry, there seems to be no question that he was initiated at some point, and there's good evidence that he never renounced the fraternity. He did, however, abandon several of his other potentially heretical enthusiasms including alchemical searches for the Philosopher's Stone, reading mystical writers, mesmeric healing, and association with the, the brothers at Avignon. Chastanier provides most of what we know about his early life and religious beliefs in a 1795 pamphlet, A Word of Advice to a Benighted World. While we're counting two life-changing dreams, which he calls visions, not like what I had last night, Chastanier reveals that he was born in 1739 in France to a Protestant family and was educated by Catholics at the College of St. Barbie in Paris in the vain hope that this would spare him the brutal prosecution often experienced by French Protestants. Chastanier says that he left school in 1757 and afterward attended many years um, at the Hotel Dieu as a surgeon. Some of this account is corroborated by Pierre Jean Grossly, who met Chastanier in 1765. Chastanier told him he was the son of a principal clerk at the Hotel de Ville, educated in Paris, and that he was then on his way back to London, where he was a surgeon apothecary. I've been able to unable to verify any of this independently of Chastanier's own word. And if you know my work, you know that I, I focus on liars and cheats. I don't think he's a liar and cheat, but I really like to have corroborating evidence and it's not there. Or at least I haven't found it yet. More on that later. Uh, however, 
This account does fit well with official records of his life in London, uh, where he arrived in October of 1763. By December that year, Chastanier was married and father to a large family. He moved fast. Uh, his wife, Marianne Vincent Chastanier, was a widow. Her age is given in the registry as 27 and his as 24. Marianne's previous husband, Francois-Marie Chastanier, died in May of 1762, leaving her with five living children. Uh, Francois-Marie, uh, excuse me, Jane Elizabeth, Marie Benedict, Peter Benedict, Michael Benedict, do you see a pattern? And Catherine. Given the uncommon occurrence of the surname Chastanier and the prevalence of Benedict, or a variant of thereof, as a second name in the family, it's possible the two men were relatives and that Francois's death prompted Benedict's move to London. Over time, Benedict and Marianne had two additional children. Maria Anne, looking at these women in the records is really fun. They're all named Mary and Anne. And John Theophilus. If one wanted a strong suggestion of Chastanier's continued affection for Freemasonry, little John's name might be a revealing clue. Settling in England, establishing himself as a husband, a father, and an apothecary, uh, left little time or money for other pursuits. However, Chastanier did do other things. And there are competing narratives about both what he did and where. When I first encountered Chastanier, I was researching a book on Ebenezer and Manoa Sibley, London brothers and, and his contemporaries. Ebenezer was a Freemason. Um, so most of the references I saw to Chastanier were in Masonic works. And their narrative goes something like this. And if you get lost in the middle, that's appropriate. Chastanier was a surgeon in Paris who joined Le Socrate before 1766, pardon my French, it's almost as bad as my Latin. Uh, then he developed a Masonic society based on Swedenborgian theosophy, which he successfully planted in London in 1767. At the same time, his efforts to cultivate the Swedenborgian rite in French Freemasonry were a failure. Further, he was elected secretary for the provinces of the Grand Lodge of France in December 1765. This information is contained in the Fichier Bossu and Jean Bossu sites, uh, Le Bihan, uh, Clavel, Gustave Bord, as well as Grand Lodge records. Bossu also notes that a brother bourgeois founded Loge de Crotte in 1766. Others have embellished the story, asserting that Chastier, Chastanier was the, the master of this lodge and that he was initiated into Freemasonry by Charles Francois Radet de Beauchene. However, at the time Chastanier would have been in Paris to be initiated, no later than midsummer 1763, Beauchene was operating through Loge La Constance, not Socrat, um, and he was involved in high degrees and later claimed his lodge was authorized by Charles III, the legitimate King of England. You can see, I hope, unless you're lost, that there are difficulties here. Uh, but there are some more. Remember that Chastanier was only 24 years old in late 1763, without an established career, and he'd just come into a large family. As he arrived in London in 1763 and married immediately, are we to believe that he nonetheless traveled back and forth between London and Paris to manage a Masonic career? Were there no lodges in London? Yes, there were lodges in London. Um, but I found no evidence in the archives at the United Grand Lodge of England that Chastanier ever participated in English Freemasonry. Now that doesn't mean he didn't. Record keeping in the 18th century was notoriously sketchy, but he just doesn't show up as far as I can tell. If he were initiated into an esoteric lodge by Beauchene, that would have scarcely left time for Socrat, which seems not to have been founded before he left for England. And then there is the business about Chastanier being elected secretary for the provinces of the Grand Lodge of France in December, 1765. 
Grosley lends weight to this account, telling us that he met Chastanier in Rochester, England, just outside Paris in 1765, as they both traveled from Paris to London. Chastanier reporting that he had made a buying trip to purchase books and drugs. Well, he was an apothecary. Still, one wonders how much time or money did Chastanier have to devote himself to being a Masonic Grand Officer? Curiously, this last bit is the best documented and perhaps the most plausible of the assertions about Chastanier's involvement in French Freemasonry. In his paper on Freemasonry in Paris until 1773, Alan Bernheim reports that the 1760s were a particularly factionalized decade in Parisian Freemasonry as reflected in Brest de la Chaussée's memoir, oh, and I've been practicing this word and I can't say it, justificatif, yes, self-justifying memoir um, of 1773. Bernheim describes the election. This is one of those things that you just really want to find, right? Bernheim describes the election at which Chastanier was reportedly chosen as secretary for the provinces. Uh, of the Grand Lodge. Quote, and I'm, there are some things I've left out here, but 39 brethren were present. That's not a lot. Brother Zumbal, acting Grand Secretary since April 1765, was elected to that office by 38 votes to one. The other candidate was a brother Labadie, whose Lodge Solomon in Paris was warranted two months before, on the 2nd of October. Labadie was elected substitute to the secretary of the provinces by 22 votes to 17, there having been eight other nominations. Now this solves one problem about Chastanier being a grand officer. If this is the same Benedict Chastanier, then at least he was expected to be an absentia. They were probably glad that he wasn't there. It was the office of substitute that was the most desirable. That's my conclusion. The situation is still curious because Bernheim explains that having an official substitute was a convention adopted, uh, adopted by aristocratic grand officers. And Chastanier was a poorly connected and struggling apothecary living in a different country. But never mind for now. There is enough doubt here and sufficient evidence later to accept that he was probably initiated in a Parisian lodge between 1760 and 1763. Um, what makes the Masonic narrative so curious is that while Chastanier himself tells us a fair amount about this time of his life, he does not mention involvement in Freemasonry at all. Before we smile or shake our heads at the triumph of careful scholarship over Masonic myth, one of my favorite tropes. We must know that, that neither does he mention any of his children or his four wives. And unlike other people I write about, he only had the one at a time. But yes, he had four. Uh, Marianne Vincent Chastanier, Anne Yates, Sarah Trinder, and Maria Maggot. And, and one wonders about that name. But he outlived them all, and, and they don't show up in his writing. He only talks vaguely about troubles. The other narrative that accounts for Chastanier in the 1760s is largely in his own voice. Um, I encountered this first person while reading about Manoa Sibley, a minister in the fledgling Swedenborgian Church of the New Jerusalem, which Chastanier joined in 1789. To listen to him, let us return to a word of advice in which Chastanier tells us that in 1763, he was disgusted with both Catholicism and Protestantism. Chastanier confesses that, quote, I had then begun to think there was nothing truly essential in religion and that it was a mere tie of human contrivances to fetter and to lead by it the multitude, unquote. He had other things to concern himself with. Family obligations pressed, and Chastanier writes that he failed to form a permanent establishment with which to support them. 
He was about to abandon London permanently when he had his first spiritual dream or vision in February of 1765, in which an old man who reveals himself to be Christ safely ferried Chastanier across a tumultuous river. Reassured, Chastanier tells us that he didn't think about religion again for several years. Um, we should all have dreams. Until when in January of 1768, he had another vision or dream. Uh, this one featuring his old Catholic college and a beautiful woman who sent him looking for her nephew, whom Chastanier later recognized to be Swedenborg. This vision marks his turn towards esotericism. Chastanier taught himself German so he could read Welling's Majo, Mago Kabbalasticum. There's my good Latin. Um, he also read Beme and William Law and what he termed other mystic writers. Chastanier was at the same time keeping company with a group of aspiring alchemists. Um, these included George Peacock, Michael Arne, a musician, uh, Irishman Peter Wolf, and John Bryan. Unlike several of those, he, he managed to elude debtor's prison because alchemy wasn't cheap. Uh, Chastanier attempted to apply his newfound alchemical knowledge in a profitable way, advertising in French journals that he had developed a superior and faster method of refining iron, which he would demonstrate to anyone who would pay his fare to France. There were no takers. And at least through 1793, we know that he plotted on as an apothecary, uh, advertising an array of truly dubious patent medicines, including Darren's medicated bouget, uh, for problems particular to gentlemen with venereal diseases. There was no treatment that really worked, so why not? Chastanier reports that through this alchemical connection, he discovered Swedenborg's writings, though not the man himself, nor even his name, by picking up a copy of Arcina Celestica in Peacock's Rooms, this mystery of heaven, which becomes such an important trans first translation for many English readers. The book was missing its title page. And, and Chastanier tells us it wasn't until 1776 that he happened upon an early translation uh, of another work in a bookshop and recognized that it was the same author. And the rest of that story becomes the early history of the Swedenborgian Church of the New Jerusalem in London. Though he was still not having any financial success, Chastanier tells us that he, quote, saw it as my duty to make it known to all my fellow sinners all over the face of the world, the heavenly doctrine, which I published in French in 1782. So this put an end to any idea that he might have about Freemasonry or alchemy or any other mystical writer but Swedenborg. Chastanier pursued his publicizing of Swedenborg's writings with a not quite yet single mind. He was working on it, but he wasn't there yet. He was not the only freshly hatched theosophist in town. And though the importance of sharing Swedenborg's theology with the world was clear to him, the best path to that goal was murkier. He industriously began transcribing and translating those works of Swedenborg he could acquire. They originally all appeared in Latin, which Chastanier knew was too restrictive for his purposes. And he eventually turned out an impressive array of translations, mostly in French, which became his special mission. He was going to take Swedenborg back to France. By 1782, Chastanier also envisioned a grand network of societies. And, and this is frequently portrayed as Masonic, but, but I read it as Swedenborgian and, and not Masonic. And, and the two meet, but, but not, not as much as people think. Um, these societies were to be spread across the world to share the load of translating and sharing um, pr and promoting Swedenborg's writings and assisting in bringing about the New Jerusalem, which he was convinced was even now descending physically from heaven. His plan, 
which failed to result in much in my reading, but mythology about a Masonic Swedenborg rite, which did not exist, was published as a little pamphlet called The General Plan for a Universal Society. Chastanier cast his net broadly, calling on the elite, here's, these are his words, the elite of the alchemists, the Kabbalists, the Freemasons, in a word, all of the occult scholars, unquote, to cooperate in the plan contributing whatever was appropriate to their special interests. He followed up on this plea two years, no, five years later in 1787 with the publication of the announcement of the New Jerusalem Journal. Um, one of the things that the, the New Jerusalem church, this early Swedenborgian church decided that they just had to do was publish journals. And they, they went through a lot of them because they were convinced that they were going to convert people by education. And the best way to educate them was through inexpensive literature. And, and so there's a whole series of, of New Jerusalem uh, journals none of them last very long in, in the 18th century, but they make fascinating reading and you can see a battle going on in them between Hindmarsh and Chassanier and Manoa Sibley as they argue about other kinds of esotericism. And Hindmarsh wins, he's, he's not a nice man, but he wins. Um, so here's, here's the first maybe of these, these journals. Um, and it's clear that Chassanier wants to use this journal as a, a venue, as a vehicle for his translations. In the preamble, he describes his ultimate goals and then introduces the first installment of his French translation of the intercourse between the spirit and the body. Here again, he makes a direct plea to lovers of the truth to join him in a vast cooperative project. This was in French. I qualified in French, but that doesn't mean a thing. And so this is my translation, and I hope you will forgive me. How much it would be for the good of humanity that the earth was everywhere covered with societies of this kind. Soon we would see the golden age of which we are announcing the beautiful dawn. Freemasons, of which I have the honor to be a brother, your respectable society is made to be emulated. You are seeking the truth now more than ever. Witness the circular letters that the Grand Orient has distributed everywhere. Here it is presented to you. Swedenborg's works will develop these emblems and symbols and figures whose exterior only is available to you. Will you not therefore seek to know the interior? It is in your best interest to make my plan successful. It is a brother who loves and respects you, who offers them to you, feeling pushed to do so not in the view of a vile and sordid interest. I'm not making money off this, but only in the desire to be of a real utility to you. Will you contribute nothing to the success of such a plan formed by such motives? And the answer was, yes, we'll contribute nothing. You're on your own. Um, he 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 didn't he didn't get many responses, any that I can tell. But he himself had changed a great deal, and had had been on a convoluted path in the time between these two messages. Chastanier was powerfully motivated by a desire to share Swedenborg's message with flesh and blood people, not just on Zoom meetings. Uh, sadly, the record is garbled. There were many small groups that formed to study Swedenborg and his writings in London and in the English provinces and even in Pennsylvania um, in, in between Swedenborg's death in 1772 and, and the early 1780s. Chastanier sought out the fellowship of their members where he could find them but putting together a reliable chronology has, has really been very difficult. And I, you know, I've worked in the archives at, at the Swedenborg house in London and it's, he's all over the place. 
1778, we know that Chastanier made contact with Thomas Hartley, who had translated the version of Swedenborg's Arkina that, that Chastanier found in Peacock's Early in the 1780s, he advertised for fellow readers to join him in a study group. And we know that when the Swedenborgian Theosophical Society formed in London in 1783, Chastanier was a founding reader. Then Chastanier's, Chastanier's heart seems to have turned inward. He'd found a spiritual home and he was less tempted to look for outside connections. He was invited but did not attend um, the Congress of Philolathes in 1784, instead sending a letter to the convocation. I don't know enough about this. Um, he's described as a Swedenborgian representative, but it's not clear to me whether this invitation was contingent upon him being an active Freemason, because I can't tell that he is. And although Chastanier was initially charmed by Count Grabianca when he came to visit the Theosophical Society in London in 70, 1785, he eventually rejected the Avignon Society over their interpretation of Swedenborg's message and a turn towards Catholic observances. And this was the prime motivation, I think behind Chastanier's pamphlet, A Word of Advice, in which he calls the Avignon Society the very antitype to the Swedenborg New Church. Likewise, Chastanier studied mesmeric healing uh, under Meneduc, but when he was unable to make it profitable, he rejected mesmerism as a false and dangerous science. So did everybody else in the Swedenborgian New Church circle. When the Theosophical Society divided over whether or not to establish a separate church, Chastanier cast his lot with the separatists and accepted baptism in the Church of the New Jerusalem. This is not Chastanier's entire story. Uh, he undertook missionary trips to Norfolk. I mean, that's a true believer going to Norfolk in the 1790s and to his native France around 1800. But as Swedenborg and the new church took up more of Chastanier's time and resources, he became desperately poor. He married three times between 1791 and 1804 and was three times made a widower. Finally, Hyde reports that Chastanier, who up until that time had acted as a guardian of Swedenborg's manuscripts in London, was forced to surrender them to new church friends as collateral for loans. He lived 1818, reportedly freezing to death on what must have been yet another missionary trip, this one to Scotland. Hyde, his affectionate biographer, although badly out of date, will have the last word. Looking over the valleys of his life to its mountaintops, we see many eminences of character in his grand fiery experiences. His means appear to have been restricted, and yet he used them mainly for the cause which filled his heart. He would be an easy victim for the heresy hunter, but he was a very furnace of desire to make the Lord's love known to his fellow mortals. I said I'd let James Hyde have the last word. Actually, I get it. Undertaking this little research project uh, under pandemic restrictions has been a challenge. I relied mostly on materials I had on hand from a previous project, uh, but I returned to them with new eyes and a different set of questions, and I found out almost everything I'd ever written about Chastanier before was wrong. Um, for some of my new questions, I, I found what to me were fresh and intriguing answers. In other cases, cut off from libraries, my own institutional library has been closed for two years, first because of reconstruction and now the pandemic. Um, I've had to leave those questions for another time or another biographer. This is open, folks. I don't need to do him. I'm a strong advocate of thoughtful and creative use of online sources, never more so than in these interesting times. I'm particularly indebted to the resources of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, 
the Museum of the United Grand Lodge of Freemasonry in England, um, the constellation of projects related to connected histories, and various genealogical sites, which I pay for, uh, especially Ancestry and Find My Past. Thanks also to my colleagues, Natalie and Rob, who pointed me in their direction of Grosley's travel memoir. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think I've been unmuted now and would like to thank you, first of all, for a fascinating talk. And I would wholeheartedly agree that Chestanier must have been desperate to travel to Norfolk in his um, zealous uh, endeavors to proselytize. Hailing, as you know, hailing uh, from Suffolk, myself, know how uh, far flung Norfolk is uh, from London. I think, can Susan reply to, to me? Can Susan be unmuted? Ah, here we go. Suffolk, Suffolk is worse. Oh. That's where, I, <laughs> that's where I did my dissertation research. Barry St. Edmunds is lovely, but Ipswich. You're not from Ipswich, are you? I'm from Barry St. Edmunds. I um, love and Barry I, St. Edmunds. And I, um, I remember talking about this when we first met at Canterbury in 2008. I, um, I'm getting old and in my dotage. Oh. Mm. Well, I would like, first of all, um, to hand over to uh, Douglas Russell, who had a question for you. Um, so if, if Douglas could be unmuted, I would appreciate that. Hello, am I, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Yes. My question was, early on in the presentation, uh, you referred to, uh, you, you've raised the question of whether Christ, Christanier, Chastanier was initiated into an esoteric lodge, possibly in France. And my question is, what does esoteric lodge mean in England or France during Chastanier's time? Rob, you want to answer that or shall I? Oh, that's for you. <laughs> so um, it, it means whatever the, the, the brothers want it to mean, I suspect. Um, the reference that I found, and, and that's not a good answer, but that's the answer I have today. Um, it, it's higher degrees beyond, beyond the, the three degrees that are commonly mm -hmm. practiced in craft lodges. Oh. And particularly in France, uh, by the time we get to the second half, uh, third, third, fourth quarter of, of the 18th century, um, there are so many higher degree systems and, and standalone degrees practicing all sorts of really interesting things, um, which, which really have relatively little to do with, with, you know, just the, the standard craft lodges. So I'm using it in a, a fairly generic term. Uh, now, if you if you want to go into much greater detail, there are there are other other historians that I would point you to, um, but but not me. Thanks. Could you name a couple of them, please. Well, Rob and Natalie. Uh, no, no more about them um, than I do. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm I not. Could just Go ahead. Interject with, um, I think Marsha Keith Scuchard has um, written a little bit about the um, um, Lambert de Lintel's French high degree lodge in London um, in the 1760s, 1770s. And she speculates as to whether Chastanier and um, um, de Linto were um, in touch, considering that I think if I'm correct in saying that Chastanier Susan lived at 62 Tottenham Court Road. And yeah, I, I, Delinto, I think they were neighbors. De Linto lived at 64. So yeah, I um, think they were neighbors. I, I didn't check up on um, the time of, of that. I, I yeah. would, I would, oh, how do I do this? I, I, I would say that Marsha's 
uh, scholarship while you know her her archival research is is just far beyond any of the rest of us but but she's very speculative and and that <sighs> Shall I sound snooty? I'm a classroom teacher, and and that doesn't doesn't meet my my standards. Um, that mm -hmm. said, you know her her work is really valuable. Um, go look at go look at her footnotes, if nothing else. Yeah, there's no I can back that up. There's no corroborative evidence of Shastanier's links with Masonic links with Delinto. They live two doors apart. That you could see how it could possibly happen, but as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence that Susan said of in in that regard. Yeah, and I'm not sure about the timing of that. I didn't look that up. Mm. I I was I was chasing Chastanier around London, uh, placing him firmly in in Huguenot settlements and and Huguenot uh, churches, um, where he married and baptized and buried his 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 family. Thank you. Um, next question I'll hand over to Cecile. Um, if Cecile could be unmuted, she asked a question about um, Chastanier and the French Revolution. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, well, thank you very much, Susan. It was uh, uh, such a pleasure listening to you. And, and I really enjoyed seeing Natalie and Robert again too. And, and thank you for paying a tribute to the Dictionnaire Le Monde Masonique because you, you were all so active, you know, and collaborating it. And that was um, fascinating. So it's a great pleasure tonight. And I really enjoyed listening to you talking about Chastanier. And Natalie is really right. I mean, you have a gift for storytelling. So, um, now, from what, I, and especially, really, I, I must admit, I was quite ignorant, you know, before you told me about Chastanier. And now I realize he had a very long life. And am I right when, uh, I think he died in 1816? So, of course, he must have lived through the French Revolution. Yeah. And did he have anything to say about that? The did he have, or was he just, how you know, or could he live just totally in his own sphere outside of the Because it seems so strange at the time. How could you escape? <laughs> you know, the, context. Yeah. The, the French Revolution was, was such an important backdrop for all of these uh, esoteric movements and, and millennial movements. And um, yeah, I, I mean, and apocalyptic movements. Um, and so it's very much the same for Chastanier. There, there are two things. Mm -hmm. The first is that um, the Church of the New, New Jerusalem in, in London is, is really getting going in 1789, and they have to prove that they're good, loyal subjects, even though they're talking about overthrowing the Anglican Church, <laughs> which is part of, <laughs> of the Constitution of Britain, right? And yes. we've got this, and we've got this revolution going on. So they are very anxious to demonstrate that they are good, loyal subjects and citizens, and they don't have anything to do with that crazy stuff going on in France. Um, and and what what I have seen in Manila Sibley, and again in Chastanier is this force, this, this, this pressure from within the, their own new church uh, to give up anything that might seem um, dangerous, uh, not, not respectable. And, and of course, that includes things like mesmerism and um, Freemasonry, you know, we'll, we'll get to uh, the, the, the acts later in the, the 1790s that, that put a, put a hold on Freemasonry or, or attempt to, um, and, and then we have all of these people, you know, like Richard Brothers and, and all of the, all of these people, um, who are 
maybe mad spouting apocalyptic prophecies. And, and so there's a lot of, of, of pressure on Shastanier to not hold any truck with any of that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, he really sees his mission in life is to bring Swedenborg to the people of France. And he sees the French Revolution as, as an impediment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, he mentions it a little yeah. bit, but, but mostly yeah. it's just an impediment. If it hadn't been mm -hmm. for the French Revolution, he wouldn't have to go to Norfolk. <laughs> he would have gone to Paris. As he yeah, did, as soon as, as soon as it was over. So you think he actually severed links with France at the time, although you say that he tried to, <laughs> yeah, to I export think he, the Swedish. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think he just didn't go. Doctrine, yeah. No, I just don't, no, he, he no. didn't go. Uh, he, he, he writes that he was able to publish a few things um, during that, during the period that he was in England, he was able to publish a few things. I think it was before the revolution when it was still under the royal censors. And his speculation was that they just didn't understand what he was writing. And so they let it through. Um, but I, I think during the revolution, he, he realized that it was just, it was too much and it was too chaotic and he was too poor to get there anyway. Mm -hmm. no, that's very interesting. And you think, fi finally, last question, do you think he might have had any links with Edmund Burke at some point? Or maybe not? Not at all. I, I can't imagine Burke mm. uh, stooping, <laughs> stooping to that. Uh, yeah, that's it. was mm. really very poor. He was really very poor. I mean, when uh, when he talked to uh, Grossly, this this fellow that Rob and Natalie uh, pointed me towards, he said, "Oh, you know, I'm a prosperous surgeon." Well, there's no evidence that he ever did anything except sell patent medicines. Um, the only thing that I've mm. ever been able to find is that in the 1790s he he took on um, an apprentice to teach mm -hmm. him uh, to be a man midwife. And, and I think that really? was a, a puff of smoke, a puff of smoke. Yeah. So it was very politically correct. See? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank Great. you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cecile, for your question. And thank you, Susan, for your answer. I have another question um, posed by Hugh. Uh, Hugh O'Neill, um, in regard to um, um, whether there was any likelihood of a connection um, between Chastanier and von Hun's strict observance, right? Um, Hugh, would you like to go further into that, please? Yes, I'm just, I think I'm unmuted. You are now, yes. Unmuted. Yes, you are. Good. Yes. Um, Yes, I, I just uh, looked up um, uh, Bob Gilbert's uh, paper in uh, AQC, which is volume 108, and he's quite definite um, in his mention of the Swedenborg uh, right uh, that it was not connected with Freemasonry as practiced in England at all. And um, in doing that, he, he quotes A.E. Waite, if you can regard him as any way reliable, uh, uh, but also A.F.A. Woodward, Woodford. Um, I was just wondering whether, in fact, there was any, whether um, Chastanier uh, had any connection with the, um, with the right of strict absor observance, which was run by von Hunt about that time. I, as far as I know, the answer would have to be no. Um, that said, you know, there, there's a lot we don't know about Chastanier. Um, but from, from what I read in his translations and in the New Church records, it, he, was, he was a very busy man. And, and for most of his life, Freemasonry didn't occupy much of his time or attention. Um, 
So, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be proved wrong, especially by a gentleman in, in such a fancy outfit. Thank you for, for putting on your, your suit and tie. And, and is there, is there, a, oh yes, there's a medallion. Oh. No, it's just, it's just, it's just the kitchen apron. That's all it is. We don't all have such grand kitchen aprons. So, so my, <laughs> my answer is no, but you know, um, no, as far as I know, I would be really surprised. Nothing is impossible. If this is the 18th century. Uh, I, I felt that he might have uh, had a connection with the um, uh, strict observance because it was uh, a bit of a Ponzi scheme and he might have been able to see a chance of making some money out of it uh, since well, he was uh, such a poor chap. He, well, well, you know, he was... himself got caught up in his own scheme. He, he was poor, but as far as I can tell, except when it comes to medicine, he was honest. Um, and, and for the medicine, you know, in the 18th century, in the 1760s, 1770s, 1780s, nothing worked. And so patent medicine, quack medicines, um, were, were in many ways, you know, as long as they didn't have mercury or arsenic in them, they were no worse than anything else. Uh, it was, it was a dire age. And so... So, you know, he sold medicated things to, to shoot up men's <clears throat> privies. And, well, they needed to pee. Um, so so I, think, I think he was honest. Uh, so, you, so you haven't come across any evidence of that. So we can, we can leave it there. We can leave it there. I'm sure there's I will, other questions. I will leave it there. And I, I wouldn't waste my time if I were you. But... If someone else wants to, they're they're more than welcome. Thank goodness we have president now. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. What was that you Susan, said? Susan, thank goodness we have presidents that recommend using bleach now in the 21st century. We've come a long way, haven't we? So we've come a long way. <laughs> Don't dangle your willy in bleach. I wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do Medical it. progress there for you. Yeah. Um, I have one more, um, two more questions. Um, have been asked, and then I might well ask the question if there's time. Um, uh, we have a question from Ugo Ozdemir. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Um, he asked that you find the uh, claim that Shastania introduced the Swedenborgian Masonic rite um, in England in 1767 is not credible. Um, but he asks about um, the plan of 1782, and could that be? Uh, um, a possible. Um, you know, I understand. Um, yeah, I, would, would, could that be the where this idea of the right yeah? I think it's absolutely the genesis of that story, and he is just so convinced, uh, both in 1782 and then later in 1787, that that if we could just get everybody together thinking good thoughts and translating Swedenborg into various languages. And, and even, as he says in 1787, using the Masonic uh, structure as a model, which, frankly, every fraternal society in the whole Western world does uh, in the 18th century, because it is made to be emulated. It really works well. Um, I think that's where the story comes from. Um, but, you know, if he, he's, he's not introducing anything Swedenborgian before he discovers Swedenborg. Um, Ugo, would you like to respond to that? Um, if you can be unmuted. Okay, now I'm allowed to unmute, I think. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, um, you are unmuted, yes. Oh, no, I mean, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm quite an outsider and this was a fascinating talk. I was just, uh, the thing I was just wondering was that could it be possible that the right was actually introduced after 1782? Would it, I mean, the, 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 the claim that the right was introduced is true, but the date was not true, uh, correct. Could you that know, be a possibility? That, uh, was my, I, that was my main question. I, I, I think greater scholars than I um, have have discounted that, uh, you know, there are undoubtedly uh, Masonic 
connections that that have uh, been very enthused by by Swedenborg. Um, but everything that I have I have encountered tells me a that Swedenborg, of course, was not a Freemason, but also that these these early accounts of Swedenborgian rights are are largely fabricated. You know, if you look at the 19th century sources for a lot of these things, um, these you know, 19th century historians were fantasists. They they make up lots of really cool stuff, but it you would you would be wasting your money to place bets on things like that being accurate. Um, what, what, what happens later and what happens on the continent, I can't speak to, I'm not qualified. Um, but I would, I would just put that one to bed and, 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 and look at later, look at later developments. Can I interject here? So I find it fascinating that this plan that he uh, proposes in 1782, um, in which you mentioned Susan Alchemy and Freemasonry in a mixture of Kabbalism, Oh all yeah, sorts. Um, all those people, and, it, and it, it chimes in very well with the Avignon Society and their doctrine as it developed from around 1787 until um, uh, around 1780, late so not for long until 1788 when uh, Ottavio Capelli comes on the scene right. in the Avignon Society and tries to um, get. Uh, steer it much more towards a, a sort of Catholic initiative. Right, right. So the, the par you know, I can see why Shastani... Yeah, it's Catholic a very really strong parallel. The Avignon, yeah. is, because that's what he was advocating for. In well, and, and yeah. maybe is, 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 you know, what he's writing in 1782, is that, is that an inspiration for the Avignon Society? Maybe. I don't know. Partly they were already in existence, but they hadn't become a formal, you know, formal... Somewhere. But they could have been reading that, that stuff. They could have been Absolutely. reading that stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating overlap, I think. Um, we have one more question from um, Dimitrios uh, Kompentis. Um, and he asks a question. Um, well, maybe Dimitrios, you'd like to ask it yourself, if you can be unmuted. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. For Hi, that. Dee. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you talk about a little bit more about the relation between Sibley's family and uh, Chastanier? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Ebenezer Sibley's brother Manoa, I mean, the book that I wrote was mostly about Ebenezer, but Manoa Sibley was a lot like Chastanier. Um, he was a spiritual seeker. He rejected established religion. He even rejected uh, Orthodox Calvinism. Uh, it was just far too grim. The idea of predestination made him weep. Uh, and he, he stumbled onto Swedenborg at about the same time that he and his brother Ebenezer started publishing uh, astrological works. And as Manoa got more involved in um, the new church, as it became first the Theosophical Society and then the new church, um, he, he gave up astrology. He gave up, you know, reading. He, he, he ran an occult bookstore and he, he continued to run the bookstore, but, but he sold translations of Swedenborg. Um, so, so two things happen in the, the early uh, Swedenborgian community in London, it, one is that there is a division by social class and, and the more cosmopolitan and the more affluent people tend to be readers of Swedenborg. They think he's cool. Um, and, and then the, the more working class people, the sons of artisans, uh, like Manoa and Ebenezer, who are, are cobblers, you know, by trade, um, they become receivers, they become believers. 
And so I see Chastanier and, and Manoa really going along a similar path of exploring um, various paths of esotericism until they come down on Swedenborg. And they, they, when they first read his writings, they have found the truth. And um, they are encouraged to give up different kinds of esotericism, but, but they do it willingly as well. And Manoa and Benedict um, were, you know, they accepted baptism at about the same time. They were, they were close. Um, it was a small community. Um, they all watched over each other. And Benedict and Manoa are the two people who were most responsible for safeguarding Swedenborg's manuscripts in London. So although I can't go further than that on their connection, I, I, I think it, it has to be close. And eventually, you know, the, the manuscripts that, that um, Chastanier is carrying when he dies had Manoa's name on them. And they were then delivered to Manoa by the ship captain who, who failed to bring Chastanier back from Scotland. So, so I think, I, you know, there, there's not much, you know, there are no letters back and forth, um, but it has to have been a close relationship. And it, it lasted through Chastanier's long life. Does that do it? Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, and can I ask one last question? I think yes, and, 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 then, question. And, and then we have to go away. Yes. Yes, it was um, the timing of um, the publication of A Word of Advice in 1795 seems to have been connected. He um, um, goes off, sounds off against the Avignon Society, but I think it's because of the Richard Brothers Ferrore and this whole idea of the yes. world yeah. coming to an end. Could, I was wondering if you could, what, how he viewed that um, period and what his... So, so I don't have it in front of me, but I can, I can tell you, I, it's, it, it's in what I call the genealogy cabinet behind me, this great big cabinet, which was my, where my mother kept genealogy and I keep scholarship. Um, the, if you look at that pamphlet, which I'm sure you have, it, it's what he writes is preceded by two letters that are about various prophets and prophecies um, that are going on at the time in, in the 1790s. And um, he is appealed to, to say something. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a time of, of, false prophets and mad prophets and apocalyptic prophets. And what he writes is definitely within that context. Um, and that's something that I haven't, I haven't investigated. I'm sure you've investigated it more than I have. What I was intrigued by was what he said. I mean, it's the clearest biographical statement we get from him. And, and so that's, that's what I was interested in. But it's a rich source for all sorts of, all sorts of readings. Do I answer your question, Ish? Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and can I just take one last um, second to add my prerogative as chair, possibly, to thank Clorinda, who I noticed was on this um, Zoom meeting, for uh, her generous um, translation of um, texts from Italian by Ottavio Capelli for um, for Natalie and I's book. So thank you to her for that. I just saw that she was on the on the Zoom call today. She was most thank generous. you, Robert. It was a pleasure to do that and to participate. You, in this wonderful lecture. It was, uh, thank it you. It was invaluable. Thank you. thank you, Clorinda. I would just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think no we're. Uh, we, I think we're ready to go. We're done for questions and thank you for everyone um, for turning up for the wonderful talk by, by Susan. And it was great to see you again, Susan, and some familiar other faces, I, Andrew, I, can, I think, and uh, John Belton, Cecile, and many others I haven't seen for a few years.
Goodbye.